All right, hello and welcome. This is going to be an explanation of stellar parallax and stellar aberration. We're going to explain this from the geocentric perspective and a flat Earth, because one of these proofs comes with an additional supplemental evidence that the Earth is curved. So we'll definitely take a look at that and see what we can do about that. So quick reference for everyone who's not familiar, these measurements will be taken in arc seconds. To conceptualize that, uh, think of looking at your field of view of the sky in, in 180 degrees for your field of view. And then if you could break the distance between one and two degrees into 60, second, 60 sections, that would be 60 minutes of arc in between one and two degrees. And then you could break each one of those arc minutes into arc seconds, which would be 60 seconds of arc per arc minute. So if you could break the distance, essentially you could break the distance down between uh, one and two degrees to one thirty six hundredth of a degree. So that's what we're dealing with. And then when we get into the more modern observations, they actually say because of satellites and due to high altitude observations with that, where there's, where there's low atmosphere, they can get even more accurate measurements where they get into the milla and micro arcs, which is one three, uh, one three million six hundred thousandth of a degree and one three billion six hundred millionth of a degree respectively. Now, um, these are more like digitalizations of accuracy and precision and all that. So who knows um, when we get to this level of it, but we'll go over the basics here. So when you Google stellar parallax, you get all these nice crisp triangles here. You get a you get a you get an Earth here. You get a Sun here. You get start your observation here. You got a star there, and then six months later, the Earth has traveled uh, 186 million miles. And then you take your second observation and you realize that in reference to background stars, there's a little displacement angle. And they say that this is only due to Earth's motion. Well, luckily we're dealing with triangles and that can't, in using triangles, using these observations, you can't disprove the heliocentric position either way. There, our position would be that the sky is in motion and the movement of the stars is what's producing the angle displacement. And like I said, because these are triangles, there is no way to falsify this using the uh, small, near, and far angles. So good luck fighting a triangle. So real quick though, what is stellar uh, parallax and what is it actually telling us? Well, we have stars out here. We have, we have stars that, appear, that appear to be fixed. And we have a slight displacement over time. So they've extrapolated that using parallax, which is a real thing that you could do to make uh, distance approximations to things. And then you could measure those distances and you know figure out how good your approximation was. Because that's the thing, right? Um, parallax is a real phenomenon. You can use it to make measurements. You can use it to make estimations. And based off of the baseline of the angle and how far away and what you're looking at is, um, you know, determines the usefulness and the accuracy of parallax and how you're using it. So that the way that they're using it here from these diagrams, it looks very, um, looks very reasonable, right? But what's actually happening is that this, the distance between the sun and the earth of a hunt that they say is 93 million miles. And then over the course of six months, uh, where the observations where the sun is, or the earth has traveled, you know, around to the other side of the sun will be, uh, uh 300 million kilometers or 186 million miles and they that they say that you with with the 186 million mile baseline they can get parallax angles all the way out to trillions quadrillions quad billions sextillions of of uh of a degree right or i'm sorry of a of a distance based off of these ang angles that converge at infinity so again we're looking at angles that look like this but What's actually happening is we have two parallel lines that converge at infinity, just trust us. All right, so again, not mutually exclusive to a heliocentric or geocentric, this observation. Now, real quick in terms of parallax, parallax should be going in one direction, the meaning that the that the star should be moving in the same direction because if the earth is the causal mechanism of the displacement as it's going around the sun has to be going in one direction. Now, um, this is a paper from, let me see, I forget the year. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Um, Dearborn real quick. Dearborn. No. All right. Well, anyway, 
what's going on? I don't remember the exact year. This is the early 1900s. What's going on here is that astronomers were making observations that they were recording their parallax observations and they found that there was negative parallax. Now, there can't be negative parallax because that would mean that the Earth isn't the causal mechanism, the Earth's motion through space isn't the causal mechanism for the displacement. So the astronomers were like, hey, what do we do with these negative parallaxes? And then we have the guide on what to do with that from Sir Frank Dyson Watson, who did the um, who did their probability fixes for everything? He was a real math wizard. So what he say what he says here says in the case of real parallax, it is given for the star of the small air. I'm sorry. Determine the value of parallax may have an air which falls on the negative side, and we can just use um, his mathematical formula to determine that the parallax angle is absolutely fine, and there's nothing nothing uh, dubious or you know nothing wrong going on with the model here. And then we have when it's double the uh, 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 when there's two stars, because of their because they're close together, they're going to have an irregular orbit or whatever. So they're saying that it's going to be faster because their gravitational attraction. So it's just an error in the photography. So you can go ahead and count that as a posi. And then for the third, they say, okay, well, those background stars that we're referencing that are fixed, right? These fixed stars that we're referencing the displacement from. Well, maybe those just moved. Oh, okay, so your re maybe your reference moved. All right, well, if that's the case, then, you know, GG, you played yourself, player. But let's go ahead and, okay, let's go ahead and continue on to the better proof, in my opinion, for heli heliocentrism. Now, they say that because these stars are so far away and their light rays come in parallel and that the Earth is going around the sun, that there's an aberration to them, that there's an aberration to the starlight. So we'll get into what that means here in a second. But this is a conceptualization of what, of what they're putting forward. And then we'll look here and we'll go back to 1727 where James Bradley uh, took his observations um, of the star Draconis Lambda or something like that, I think it was over uh, somewhere in London. And what he, what he had is set up was this telescope was angled at like 90 degrees. And then he, f he found that he had to tilt it slightly to keep the starlight in the center of the telescope. And over the course of a year, when you plot that out, the amount that he would have had to tilt it comes out to 20 arc seconds. So they're, what they're saying is that there's an aberration of starlight that traces out for to 20 arc seconds in the sky and that it's relative to the latitude, meaning that if you were at the North Pole, the arc in, in the sky would trace out to be a, like a perfect circle. And then, at, and then at the 45th latitude, right around London, where he was taking his observations, you would get um, more of an ellipse. And then around Florida, South, uh, South America, et cetera, you would get a yeah, more pronounced ellipse, and then at the equator, you would get a straight-up line. So if you look at um, star trails at the equator or near the equator, you'll see that convergence and divergence to the respective hemispheres. And then you'll see that straight line towards the middle. So you can kind of conceptualize it that way. It's pretty much exactly what he's putting forward. And he's saying that over the course of a year that there's minor displacement. And when you ratio that angle against the speed of light, you get 30 kilometers a second. So this was the best evidence put forward for heliocentrism because the earth, if this model is true, the earth moving around the sun, it has to be moving at 30 kilometers a second. So this is a good ratio for them. Unfortunately for them, and this was recognized at the time, especially by your boy, Wilhelm Wellum here in 1898, where he goes over 10 failed experiments to prove earth's motion. And um, the only positive one that he put forward was this ratio for stellar aberration. But he notes in there that this is kinematics. It's not, you know, an actual proof because there's no independent, there's no experiment, right? There's no independent dependent variable. So in kinematics, you make a measurement. And then based off of that measurement, you make prediction, you make future predictions of motion with no assertions of causal mechanisms or dynamic forces or anything like that. So what this means is this, this uh, measurement cannot tell us if the earth is in motion or if the sky is in motion or if there's a medium in between us that's in motion uh, translated from the rotation of the sky that's causing a slight drag <clears throat> that causes the aberration. Um, so to figure this out, 
we'll have to introduce some independent variables and do some experimenting here, which we'll get to in a second. But quickly, let's run down the flat earth explanation and geocentric explanations for this. So geocentric explanation, right, for the globularist, they would say that their the potential explanation they could give is that the star field rotates every night. And to complete that rotation, you know, it's happening very fast. And that creates a slight aberration over the course of a year, which is what's producing this. You could also say that the that the earth, or I mean, sorry, that the sky is translating its motion down to earth and the ether wind that's translating that motion, there's a Fresnel drag and it's causing the that apparent drift in the starlight to make the aberration. So there's a couple of explanations you could give for that. And then for the flat earth explanation, because how do we, how do we explain these, the arc um, relative to the latitude, right? If, if we're on a flat earth, it would be circles all the time, right? Unless, oops, unless we see in curved visual space, which thankfully we do. So we see, so here's a little diagram of a Vith Miller torus, which is modeled after curved visual space. And what we have here is your left and right eye. If you take a sphere, uh, a disc and intersect intersect it horizontally, or I'm sorry, vertically, and then rotate that 360 degrees for both eyes, you would get uh, basically this. So you see in like little latitude longitude lines, and this creates a near field and far field, which has different optical compression rates. And to learn more about that, I definitely recommend going to adl.place and going to Shane's database and learning more about 69 miles per degree. So if you wanna learn more about how curved visual space um, replaces the optical curve, or replaces the physical curvature of Earth, they say, there that's alleged that's supposed to be there, um, there's all the math for all that to explain all of these celestial observations in that regard. So anyway, when you model all this out over a plane, it would all be the same. I'm not gonna bother playing the videos here for this. Um, so I'm trying to move on to the dynamics to, or to the to the experimental uh, evidence that the Earth is stationary and that these observations prove that the sky is in motion. So, like I was saying earlier, kinematics and dynamics, right? How do we make the distinction between kinematics and see if there is an actual causal mechanism for this motion? What is the causal mechanism? So we have Aries failure in 1872. So Airy comes along and he says, hey, hey, James Bradley, I'll help you out. We can see which is moving. So if the starlight is coming in at this at this angle and I have to correct my telescope a little bit for it off center, off like so at 90, 90 degrees, I have to tilt it just a little bit with no water in it, right? And with the slight tilt and no water in it, what's on the table, right? What's What's on the table here is that the earth could be in motion at 30 kilometers a second or the sky could be in motion at 30 kilometers a second, okay? Now, what can we do to determine that is we'll fill the telescope with water. And when we fill it with water, oh no, my water, oops, I'm not, I'm not on the right thing. When we fill the telescope with water, the, if the Earth is in motion, then the starlight will be slowed down and when it gets slowed down, it'll ha I will have to correct my telescope even further to keep the starlight in the center. And the predicted amount was 30 arc seconds of tilt. So they were saying they were going to have to tilt the telescope forward by 30 arc seconds in total over the course of a year. And what they found is that they only had to tilt it 0 0.8 arc seconds. So a fraction of an arc second, not even a full arc second when the telescope is filled with water. What that means is the starlight is already coming in at that, at that angle, it's apparent, right? There's no, the actual physical location of the star is unknown and the light we see is its apparent location. And uh, there's no real way to refute that. The only way you could refute that, right, is we'll get into this, this uh, experiment. So. The experiment was done under the hypothesis of a stationary ether in a moving Earth. So if there's a slight displacement angle, does that mean that the Earth is moving slow, or does that mean that there's no ether, right? Well, if the, if the heliocentric model is true, then the displacement angle 
would have to be proportional to the Earth's velocity. Now, because that's not the case, that's no longer on the table. What's on the table is that the Earth is stationary with respect to an ether wind. So they say that their position of a stationary ether in a moving Earth is untenable. And they say that, um, well, they later go on to explain the experiment by saying, okay, well, we'll get into what Mickelson, uh, like why this experiment is so important, right? Why this matters. Because it didn't falsify the ether, it falsified the Earth's motion, and here's why. Here's why. So here we have Mickelson Morley in his 1887 paper saying, t talking on uh, Aries, Oh, that Aries failure paper that we were just going over, that, ex that whole experiment. So he says here, but it failed to account for the fact proved by experiment that the aberration was unchanged when the observations were made with a telescope filled with water. For if, the for if the tangent of the aberration is the ratio of the velocity of Earth to the velocity of light, since the latter velocity in the water is three-fourths its velocity in a vacuum, then the aberration observed with water in the telescope would should be four-thirds its true value with a little asterisk here. So... We're going to read the asterisk, and he says, It may be noticed that most writers admit the sufficiency of the explanation according to the emission theory of light, and the emission theory is that light is little corpuscles, so that's little particles, while in fact the difficulty is even greater according to the undulatory theory, and the undulatory theory is the wave theory, so light's just a wave. And then he says, for the emission theory, the velocity of light must be greater in the telescope, in the water telescope, and therefore the angle of aberration should be less. Hence, in order to reduce it to its true value, we must make the absurd hypothesis that the motion of the water in the telescope carries the light in the opposite direction. So, for the emission lads, or for, and in modern times, for the dual particle quantized light particle um, lads, you would have to say that when this when the water hits the tel or when the uh, starlight hits the telescope, it goes faster. It's, tra it's traveling its normal speed, normal speed, normal speed, and then boom, it travels faster to get down here. It has to accelerate. Now this violates the conservation their conservation laws regarding how light works. This shouldn't that can't happen because then and then it slows. So then so it it speeds up to keep its proportional speed in here, and then when it gets out, it slows down back to its regular speed. That's not that's obviously not what happens. And then for the wave lads, now remember this is taken with a stationary ether hypothesis, right? So the stationary ether out here, stationary ether inside the telescope. But but because this experiment didn't go the way they wanted, they say that the stationary ether out here is different th than the ether inside of the telescope. The ether inside of the telescope is moving and it's carrying the water in the or it's carrying it's car the. Uh, the ether in the telescope is carrying the starlight in the opposite direction of motion. And that's noted from Mickelson, Albert Mickelson, saying that's an absurd hypothesis. So that's unfortunate for the heliocentrists that believe that the Earth is in motion. And that's great for the stationary Earth lads and for the lads that believe in an ether or that adopt the ether model. You can explain it. The observations directly, right? Electromagnetic propagation as a medium, and it's in motion. And it's in motion with the sky, and that's causing a drift. And that's it. Very straightforward. Um, all right. I hope that covers everything, and I hope everyone gets a chance to read these papers, especially Mickelson, Morley, and Fazau, and where's the other one? Aries failure. Because the only explanation that the offered by the relativist and heliocentrist is to gaslight you. So when you have the knowledge, you can stand on it and not get gaslit.